Hello, my viewers and subscribers. Welcome to another episode of Jamaica Politics Uncovered. Today, guys, we're going to uncover some mysteries on our beautiful island of Jamaica regarding our politics and the road to republic. So as you may know, guys, if you follow our politics and what's happening, we are about to decolonize. And a shocking revelation came about in the political arena. Mark Golding, the opposition leader of Jamaica and member of the People's National Party, is a UK citizen. And he says he's born in Jamaica and he's also a Jamaican citizen. Well, well, the normal course of action for anyone who aspires to lead a country is to show loyalty and give up any other citizenship that he or she may have. But Mark Golding is not doing that. He wants to hold on to his British citizenship and also lead Jamaica. So there's a national debate and a national discussion on it. And I want to delve into Mark Golding's uh, presence in Jamaica and that of his father, Sir John Golding, who was knighted by the UK, by the royal family. The most shocking thing of all, guys, is that Mark Golding ran against Lisa Hanna, Jamaican, in 2020 for the presidency of the People's National Party. And no one in the PNP seemed to know that Mark Golding all along, all these years, since he's been in politics 2007, that he was a British citizen and maintained his citizenship. Even had a valid UK passport and only got his Jamaican passport at 47 years old. Let us go back to 1953 when Mark Golding's father first arrived in Jamaica. So Queen Elizabeth came to Jamaica in the year 1953. It's the same trip that Mark Golding's father came on, on the Queen's Gothic ship. Mark Golding doesn't really tell the story that his father came with the Queen. When his father arrived in 1953, the polio outbreak was actually six months later in 1954. The story was told about Mark Golding's father as if he came to Jamaica primarily to take care of people with polio. That's not true. He actually arrived in Jamaica before the polio outbreak. So why did he come to Jamaica and why did he come with the Queen? I will let you guys answer that for yourselves. When they say that Jamaica is the jewel of the Caribbean, it is true. Jamaica was a very special place for some reason for Queen Elizabeth II and her family. In fact, Queen Elizabeth visited Jamaica six times. First, in 1953, 1966, 1975, 1983, 1994, and 2002. It's every decade that she would visit. And when she couldn't make it, she would send her grandkids and other family members. For example, Princess Margaret visited Jamaica in 1955 to attend the island's celebrations. During the tour, the princess opened a new hospital at Morant Bay, which was named in her honor. She was also there to represent the queen in 1962 for our independence celebration. Jamaica was probably the most visited colony by Queen Elizabeth II during her reign. So whatever the reason you came up with for the purpose of Mark Golding's father, John Golding's visit to Jamaica, in the end, the Mona Rehab Center was named after him and other things, you know, he had his name attached to the University of the West Indies, and other things. So, so we established that his reason for coming to Jamaica with the Queen was not to address polio or to save Jamaicans from polio because there was no polio outbreak when he arrived in Jamaica. It's six months after that we heard of this outbreak in Jamaica. So that is an important piece of information for you. In 2013, another member of the royal family visited Jamaica on behalf of Queen Elizabeth II. His name is His Royal Highness, Prince Michael of Kent. Kent visited Jamaica as a special guest of the National Road Safety Council during their 20th anniversary celebration. He was known as an advocate for road safety. 
The prince was on a five-day visit to Jamaica, which entailed visits to Mark Golding's father's rehab center, the University of the West Indies, King ha King's House, and also the Ministry of Transport and Works. He is the first cousin of Queen Elizabeth II. During the prince's visit, he was hosted, chaperoned by Mark Golding and his family. Mark Golding and his mother, Lady Golding, and his father, Sir Golding. But you did not see his wife, Sandra Golding. During the prince's visit, he also unveiled a plaque engraved with his name and his title. These ceremonial events are quite common with the British royals. And it's kind of the same way that Sir John Golding had his name engraved on the Mona Rehab Center, Yui, and, you know, these kind of things give credence and prestige to people, you know. It's a very common thing. And we can see and understand why it would appear that, you know, there were no other doctors or even a health ministry in Jamaica. You know, it would appear that Sir John Golding was the only one who uh, attended to, you know, people who had medical issues during that time. When in truth and fact, Jamaica had a pretty decent uh, health care system, you know, and people were getting care. And there are so many other doctors in Jamaica during that time whose names were not engraved on anything, but they were working. During this visit, where uh, members of the royal family visited Jamaica, they actually went into Mark Golding's constituency, where he is the member of parliament. During this time, he was also the leader of the opposition. I think Mark Golding had a rude awakening during this visit. Jamaican citizen, British citizen, opposition leader, must act on behalf of the Jamaican people. During this visit and the royal tour throughout the Commonwealth, it was a very unpopular time for the British royal family. If you guys recall, that's when we saw all the protests against them across different Commonwealth regions. It's when Andrew Holness said, hey, welcome, but we're moving on. This was when things got a little uncomfortable. Mark Golding, knowing his immigration status, his language suddenly became, we need to talk about reparation. He wasn't using that language during the visit and tour of uh, Prince Michael of Kent. He was very jovial, happy-go-lucky. This time was very different. Certainly a different time from when his father first arrived in Jamaica with the Queen in 1953. The Commonwealth countries started to shift. They wanted their own heads of state. They wanted reparation. They wanted their own independence. And the British royal family had become more unpopular. Now, where we are today with Mark Golding being one year away from a general election in Jamaica and the new revelation that he had been a British citizen all along, all of his life, with both of his parents being born in Britain and him being the first to be born outside of Britain in Jamaica. And Jamaicans are saying, wait a minute, we didn't know that. Members of the People's National Party are like, what? He ran for the presidency of the party and we didn't know that he was a British citizen? Or is it that some members knew but thought, hey, hell will break loose when everybody find out or it'll be fine, Jamaicans will accept it. People are asking him to renounce that citizenship. And especially at a time when Jamaica is about to decolonize and become a republic with its own head of state. He said no. He said maybe I will do it at a later date. But I am within the constitution of Jamaica to have my citizenship as a member of the Commonwealth. I don't see why this is a big issue. But it's to be clear that you have no other law. Well, first of all, the PM is not really in a position to say that because the PM has sworn allegiance to the king. He says he doesn't see the big deal, but Simone explained it to him. She said, you cannot have dual citizenship. You must be loyal to the country you're trying to serve and lead and no other country. And then he hurls an attack on the prime minister that he swore allegiance to the king which is completely false. Andrew Holness is citizen of Jamaica and Jamaica only. 
No other country. When did it become okay to just start lying on people blatantly? Mark Golding is the one who swore allegiance to the king having British citizenship. Why is he so hesitant to renounce citizenship from Great Britain? Is it because he has assets there, businesses there? Is it? Is it family and tradition that will cause him to feel weird being the only one of his family members to not have British citizenship? We don't care. I personally don't care. But I think the Jamaican people deserve to have a leader who only has loyalty to Jamaica, no conflict of interest. What is certain, though, is that the deception that is oozing from this situation with Mark Golding being a citizen from the day he was born of the UK and, you know, not telling anybody before he seeks the highest office of the land in Jamaica, you know, I don't think that will ever go away no matter what. The fact that he challenged Jamaican citizens for the leadership of the PNP and he told no one or didn't make it clear to the party that he is a British citizen and doesn't want to renounce that citizenship. This has to be the most bizarre situation in our political history. When Edward Siaga gave up his U.S. citizenship, he was not forced to. He was not asked to. He made that decision because he said, and I quote, I don't believe you can serve two flags. He was very much aware of the society that he lived in and the people within that society. He regarded the fact that those people would be looking to a Jamaican with loyalty to Jamaica to represent them. And the other part, the much larger section of our Jamaica is comprised of an Afrocentric traditional society, our folk society, our rural society, our inner city people. Whether you like Edward Siaga or not, one thing for certain is that he proved himself to the people that he was with Jamaica and Jamaica only, all the way, for better or for worse, through sickness and in health. He made that vow and he made that oath to Jamaica the moment he decided to renounce his other citizenship. Edward Siaga spent some time in the United States at Harvard University. His parents are Lebanese Jamaican. When it came down to it, without any pressure, without any force, without any hesitation, he made the decision to pledge allegiance to Jamaica and Jamaica only. Good morning, ministers. Sashana Small from the Glino. Minister Malahu, can you clarify one of the recommendations in the CRC report as it relates to citizenship? It says Jamaican citizen should be the essential qualifying citizenship criterion for membership in parliament. So can you clarify what essential here refers to? Is this saying that the only citizenship that should be allowed in parliament is Jamaican citizenship? Tell you what, I'm going to invite Dr. Barnett to assist in answering that question. I know the answer, but um, yes. Dr. B, would you please come to the lecture? If, if if, I'm sorry. Please come Doc. to the lecture. Yes. Yes, essential means what it means, that that is the critical and most important qualification necessary for the holding of these important offices. And it has been applied to the president also that we recommend should be established in the new Republican form of constitution. The question which has arisen is not as to whether Jamaican citizenship should be the essential qualification, but what is the impact where a person has dual or other citizenships. And 
the approach which was taken by the Constitutional Reform Committee is that other citizenship, which as we know can result from the fact that my grandmother married somebody else in another country which gives me citizenship by descent, should not disqualify me. That was the basic approach we took. But focused on the essentials of that duality, and that is whether or not that person has a conflicting allegiance. And we know that there's a Jamaican decision which says it's not merely possessing dual citizenship that is the relevant criterion, but whether there is conflicting allegiance. Because we took the view that if a person is representing Jamaicans in our parliament, then that person cannot owe a duty to another state, which may sometimes come into conflict with Jamaica's interests. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barnett. There is a follow-up. Dr. Barnett, but given the conversation that has been taking place in the public uh, relating to dual citizenship, should we therefore then amend the Constitution to allow for parliamentarians to only have Jamaican citizenship to sit in Parliament? Well, that is something which, as you see, as a reason since our report was, was uh, submitted, uh, in the sense that when we examine the matter, we examine it in the context of established principles and almost an established national consensus on what is a proper test. And so we extend it and apply the test in the recommendations which we made. So this new... Uh, dispute, call it that, which has a reason in relation to whether the nominal holding of citizenship, let me call it that, should be a disqualification, is one that we did not consider in that context. We dealt with the substance. So that if the cabinet were a committee appointed by the cabinet, responsibility to the cabinet, as far as I'm concerned, if the cabinet asks us to reconsider the matter. I'm sure all the members will be quite willing to reconsider it in the context of that new dimension. I'm sorry, Doc, I, I, I figure you've answered, but just to ensure that there is an, out of an abundance of caution, uh, there's someone online as well who is asking, is there a distinction that the committee would want to make between average citizens uh, sitting uh, and running as members of parliament uh, as opposed to leaders of the particular party running... Well, that is the be, question which yes. is the reason I believe. Yes. Uh, that is one way of putting it. But the committee has not met to, as I say, to deal with it in that particular context. So it will have to be resubmitted to the committee if it is so desired. Thank you, Doc. Guys, make sure you're subscribed. Mm -hmm.